Hi, my name is uh, Greg Anderson. I'm the Eisenmill Technology Manager here at uh, Glencore Technology. Today I'm going to take you through the Eisenmill grinding technology, where it came from, how it works, why it's different, how you can benefit from it, and then we'll take a live cross to MacArthur River to have a look at some uh, Eisenmills operating. So the Eisenmill wasn't originally developed with the aim of having a technology to sell into the mineral processing industry. It was developed to address a need, uh, a mineral processing need that couldn't be solved using any of the existing mineral processing uh, technology or processes that were available in the industry at the time. The problem that it was trying to address uh, was liberation. And in the late uh, 1980s, Mount Isa Mines had two major liberation issues. The first at the Mount Isa lead zinc concentrator where performance had been progressively deteriorating over the, uh, the uh, preceding years, um, such that uh, concentrate grade was, uh, was, um, was deteriorating, and um, that was essentially due to an increasing complexity of the ore body being treated. And it was recognised that uh, finer grinding there was required. And the second problem uh, was the inability to develop a solution um, to allow the massive MacArthur River lead zinc deposit uh, to come online. In both of those cases, it was recognised that uh, grinding down to as low as 7 microns was required and able to produce um, saleable concentrate grades. All of the um, existing technology within the industry, um, through years of uh, research and test work, was shown to be inadequate. And this was essentially due to the high specific energy consumption required to grind down uh, to 7 microns. But also, even when they could grind down to 7 microns, there was a very poor subsequent flotation response, uh, essentially due to the amount of iron hydroxides precipitated on the surface of the freshly ground particles, due to the uh, high concentrations of steel uh, consumed in the grinding process. So, having exhausted all avenues uh, within the mineral processing industry, um, Mount Isa Mines uh, decided to look outside of of the mineral industry into other industries uh, that had to grind fine. So these included industries uh, that were grinding things like paints and pigments, pharmaceuticals, chocolate and so forth. Um, and they looked into those industries that had to grind a, a lot finer than the 7 micron target uh, that they were targeting. Um, and eventually they, um, uh, they linked up uh, with a company called Netsch from Germany who had been manufacturing mills um, to sell into those industries for a very long time. Um, now, the mining industry is very different to those other types of industries. Those other industries um, do things on a much uh, smaller scale. They have much higher value product. Um, they typically uh, do it in a much cleaner environment. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they were, were batch processed. Um, so they undertook a, a large development program uh, with Netsch, and that was essentially to make uh, the mill more robust uh, for the mining industry. So it had to be uh, continuous, had to be able to operate at large scale, had to have high availability, um, it had to be operable, um, it had to ha be easy to maintain, um, and importantly, it had to be energy efficient and be able to grind in an inert environment. And after that long development program that really culminated in the commissioning of the first mill at uh, Mount Isa in 1994, and that was then followed by the commissioning of the MacArthur River deposit for which the Isa mill was essentially the enabling technology. Um, and based on the success of mills in those two installations, uh, it was decided to commercialise the technology in 1998 and make it available to the rest of the uh, mineral processing industry. And it was really seen as a, it was a game-changing technology because it, it now uh, made it realistic for sites to be able to, to grind much finer than they had before um, at reasonable energy consumptions and actually be able to float the product um, afterwards. So the Isa mill was essentially created um, out of a necessity uh, to solve a mineral processing problem. And um, it's really um, taken off since then. So if we look at... Um, where the Eisen mill has gone since, since 1994. We now have uh, nearly 130 installations, um, totaling over 220 megawatts, um, spread across uh, over 21 countries. In terms of the commodities um, that have been processed in the Eisen mill, 
Uh, the bulk of the installations are in the, the platinum industry, uh, mostly in South Africa. We have over 80 megawatts there. Um, large installations in lead and zinc, where it all started, over 50 megawatts. Um, over 50 megawatts in copper as well, and a large base of over 20 megawatts in the gold industry. There are also other installations in magnetite, moly, nickel, tin and coal. The mills uh, typically treat feed sizes up to 250 microns, have also treated up to 300 microns. Um, product sizes anywhere from 6 microns to 70 microns, depending on the, the duty at the site. Uh, most of the mills now will use a ceramic media, and that typically consumes at about 10 grams per kilowatt hour, depending on the, um, the quality of the ceramic used and the duty that it's in. Um, most of the mills will be used in, in a flotation regrind duty. Um, there's also quite a number of mills in mainstream grinding. Uh, that's, that's typical in some of the installations in South Africa where they take the rougher tail, regrind that before scavenger flotation. Uh, and then the other main duty is the um, regrinding before leaching. And so the Iser mills are uh, essentially the cornerstone of the, the Albion process, uh, being the enabling technology there to enable uh, atmospheric leaching. Um, we have quite a range of, of mill sizes. So the most popular is, is the M10,000, uh, which is a three megawatt mill. We have over 50 of those um, installed now, and ranging down from the 5,000, 3,000, 1,500, all, all the way down to the 75 kilowatt M100. And our latest mill is the M15000 Iser mill, which can take up to a 3.8 uh, megawatt motor. And that mill is uh, undergoing its trial assembly in Germany uh, next week. So the Iser mill was essentially developed by a mining company for the mining industry. Um, and it re it's really changed the mining industry in terms of being able to grind to those fine sizes. Um, it's proven uh, real world performance in the hard rock mining industry. Uh, it's been doing it for nearly 25 years now, so there's a, there's a long, solid track record there. Um, and this really positions it as, as the industry-leading stirred milling technology. This is a schematic of uh, what a typical Iser mill layout would look like today for a single um, Iser mill plant. This is an M10,000. Um, for those of you that have seen uh, an Iser mill, this will look a little bit different to the, the plant layouts that you've seen. We've developed this over the last two to three years. And it's, it's really a culmination of everything we've learned over the last 20 plus years uh, in operation and design of the circuits. The main change here is that the, the mill has been brought a lot lower to the ground by removal of the media bin from under the mill. It's been, been placed to the, uh, to the top here. Um, the, um, that's allowed uh, a big reduction in the amount of concrete and steel uh, going into the plant and has meant that um, we've been able to reduce the overall package cost by about 25%. And we've also brought the, the overall footprint of the mill down by about the same amount. So how does the mill work? So this is a, uh, a uh, M5000 Iser mill. The grinding chamber's uh, on the left there. Um, the feed comes in at the non-drive end and passes out at the drive end of, of the mill. We then have the, uh, the drive train of the mill, so the, the bearings, the gearbox um, and the motor. Um, if we take a look inside the mill, um, so what we see here is the, uh, the shell has been pushed back along the rails, so this is the typical maintenance uh, position for the mill. Um, uh, we have the, uh, the grinding discs um, sitting along the shaft, they're equally spaced. Uh, and this uh, shaft here, this particular one will be rotating at about 320 RPM. That generates a tip speed on the discs of about 20 metres per second. Uh, within the mill, we would have the grinding beads. Um, as I said before, that's uh, ceramic media, so typically anywhere from one millimetre to six millimetres. And that uh, grinding media will be sitting between the discs. As the discs rotate, they agitate that grinding media, and that sets up a, uh, a series of uh, grinding chambers along the length of the mill. And the, um, the slurry which enters the mill on the right-hand side here must pass through each of those grinding chambers in series before it has a chance to reach the discharge end of the mill. And at the discharge end of the mill here, we have what's called the, the product separator or the rotor. Um, this essentially creates a pumping action within the mill and that's, that retains the grinding media within the mill whilst allowing the ground product uh, to, to leave the mill. So if we take a look at a, a little cutaway inside the mill here, again, we can see the discs based along the shaft. Uh, the brown material 
is meant to represent the media and slurry uh, within the mill. Um, so we can see here it's showing uh, the, uh, one of the agitated zones of, of grinding media. So if we take a, a little closer look at that, um, what happens is that as the disc rotate, the, the holes in the disc here, which are called the, the kidney holes, they essentially give the motion to the media. Uh, because the discs are rotating, it pulls that media out along the face of the disc. And this happens along the opposing face of the other disc as well. So as that media is pulled out towards the shell, it essentially has nowhere to go once it gets to the shell. So it turns around and comes back in towards the centre. And this essentially sets up these recirculating patterns of media um, uh, between the discs. And that, that is occurring all the way around uh, the shaft. So the grinding, the um, slurry that comes into the mill must pass through each of these grinding chambers in series uh, before it gets to the end. So as it pass through, passes through each of these grinding chambers, it then reaches the product separator end of the mill. And you'll note there that the, uh, the last disc in the mill is, is quite a bit closer to what we call the rotor disc, the yellow one. Um, this means that we don't get that recirculating motion in that zone. We get a straight centrifugal force towards the shell. So any large uh, particles, um, particularly such as the grinding media that enters that zone, is centrifuged towards the shell. And then that is essentially pumped back towards the feed end um, by the action of the rotor, which acts a bit like a centrifugal pump. So if we look at the end of the mill there, it comes through the last disc. Um, because of this close spacing there, it's centrifuged towards the shell, any coarse material. Um, the balance passes through into the rotor. Um, a volume of that is pumped back towards the feed end. It, it simply collects any material in this zone and, and pushes it back towards the feed end. So that's what retains the media within the mill. The balance of uh, product equal to the feed flow coming into the mill passes through the discharge ring. Um, it looks a little bit like a screen, but it's, it's not a screen. The, um, the holes on it are 10 to 12 millimetres in size, and the, uh, the biggest material in the mill should essentially be your media size, which in most cases is no more than six millimetres. So that's essentially just distributing the flow before it comes out of the mill and helping the uh, pumping action of the rotor. So we don't need fine screens in the mill to retain the media. Um, it's all done uh, using the product separator. So if we take a, a look at this video here as to um, the mill in operation. So this is a 20 litre mill with a glass shell, uh, just some glass beads and water pumping through the mill. Feet on the left, rotor on the right. So as the mill comes up to speed, you see that all the media clears the rotor area. Um, so the, the media is held to the left in the grinding zone through which all the slurry would be passing. And that then moves into the uh, product separator area, which is free of media, and the uh, ground material would, uh, would leave the mill. Another quick video just to show the um, plug flow nature through the mill. So here we're injecting just a little bit of blue dye into the mill. Now you can see that um, it's got to pass through each of those grinding chambers in series before it has a chance to, to exit the mill. So what are the key differentiators of the Eisen mill? So the, the first and most obvious one is the fact that it's horizontal. It's the only commercially available horizontal mill on the market. Um, and this was one of the key factors that had to be decided during the development program with Netch was would the mill be vertical or horizontal? Now Netch make uh, both vertical and horizontal mills for all the other industries they supply in. And their very uh, strong recommendation was that the mill should be a horizontal uh, design. And um, we've seen the benefits of that, uh, having selected the horizontal design. So one of the main benefits um, is the safe and easy maintenance access. Um, all the main components are on one level. Uh, so there's no working at heights. There's no scaffolding. The shaft doesn't require removal um, to replace the discs. Um, basically, the, um, the shell uh, shown here at the bottom uh, is, is just pushed back, and that reveals the internals of the mill. The mill undergoes a, um, a flushing cycle before it's shut down for maintenance and that leaves all the internals clean, um, ready to be maintained. All of the high wearing components are at the non-drive end of the mill. Um, so simply once this is pushed back, uh, the maintainers would come in, remove the shaft end cap and uh, just simply push the discs off the mill like shown here on the right. Those discs can then be turned around, placed in a different position or swapped out for new discs as required. So the maintenance is, is very simple and, and very safe. 
Um, the horizontal layer also allows the mill to restart under load every time. Um, all of the disks are available to turn the charge. Uh, because the mill is sitting horizontal, the charge spreads over all of the disks in the mill. Um, in a vertical mill, everything drops to the bottom, um, which means all of the torque goes onto the bottom disks. Um, and it can be a lot more difficult to restart under full load and you may have to dump some of the charge out of the mill. Um, the horizontal layout gives it a, a very low structure height, um, which means simple foundations, very simple process layout, uh, and a lower overall installed cost. Um, the mill is very safe, um, easy, and, and quick to install, being horizontal. Um, and finally, on the horizontal layout, there's no short circuiting in the mill, as, as we talked about with those grinding chambers in series. It's virtually impossible for any slurry to get from one end of the mill to the other uh, without coming into contact with any of the grinding media. This, um, this feature essentially allows the mill, in conjunction with the product separator, to operate in open circuit and produce a very sharp um, product size distribution. So this... Um, this graph here uh, simply shows a, a rougher concentrate treated through the Eisen mill to varying degrees of um, specific energy input. So the feed is, is on the right here, and then the product's on the left. And this is simply a single pass through the Eisen mill uh, coming straight out. As you can see, it produces a very sharp product size distribution. Um, so all of the, the bulk of the energy is going into grinding the um, particles at the coarse end, which is where you want the energy to be going. We're not making a whole lot of ultrafines, um, and it's producing quite a sharp P98 to P80 ratio, which is beneficial for downstream flotation and leaching performance. And as we said before, there's no fine screens needed to do that. It's all, it's all done in, in open circuit. Um, the use of fine inert media um, is, is a key, uh, specifically for the energy efficiency in the mill. And this is what really gave the Eisen mill um, the energy efficiency advantage that we didn't see um, in the bore mills and the tower mills. It's the ability to use that fine grinding media, which means for a given volume of grinding media, you've got much more surface area um, active in the mill uh, that can grind the particles. And that's really important for when you're trying to grind to fine sizes. Um, the Eisen mill was originally designed to be able to use cheap inert media such as sand or slag or even an autogenous ore component um, because at the time uh, ceramics were very expensive and, and really considered to be uneconomic for the process. However, um, most mills now use ceramic beads and it was the Eisen mill uh, that drove the availability of cheap ceramic media. Um, over 10 years ago now we started a uh, media development program with, with Magato from Belgium and with the, um, the development of the media uh, that we did with them and the rollout of Eisen mills at the time essentially um, created a market for ceramic media into which um, quite a number of ceramic media suppliers have used now, have moved now, and that's really driven down the price of ceramic media such that it's, it's now available and, and economic not just for Eisen mills but for most other stirred mills as well. However, it's important to note that, that not all ceramics are, are equal. There's, there's quite a number of good ceramics on the market, but there's also some, some quite poor ceramics. And if you, uh, if you select the wrong ceramic, it, it can cost you dearly in terms of uh, wear rates and overall performance. Um, now the other thing about being able to use um, the inert media was that it produces the clean surfaces in the mill. So previously, when we were grinding with steel media uh, in the ball and tower mills, um, the particles had a lot of iron hydroxides precipitated on the surface. Um, if you grind with inert media, you're creating a lot of fresh surface. Uh, it's very clean. And then once you uh, create the correct pulp conditions, uh, you can get a very good flotation separation response. Um, power intensity, um, I think this, this photo really speaks for itself. At the top is a 450 kilowatt bore mill, uh, and down the bottom is, is a 500 kilowatt eyes mill. So we pack a lot more power into a lot smaller volume. The Eisen mill has accurate, proven, direct one-to-one -one scale up. So th this, is, this has been proven since the very first Eisen mill at Mount Isa, uh, right through to the latest Eisen mills. Um, we, we get a direct one-to-one -one scale up from our laboratory test work, which is done on an M4 Eisen mill. This is a four-litre Eisen mill. Um, all our test work is done by world-class 
independent laboratories. Um, so we accredit those laboratories um, every two years. We accredit the operator at the laboratory. So some laboratories will have a number of operators accredited. And every two years they must pass um, a, what we call a blind uh, test. And that test um, must match uh, the standard sample that, that we have also processed. Um, and this ensures that the test that the labs are doing, um, every lab would come out with the same result. Um, and that ensures that um, we can guarantee to our clients that the result we get from the lab, we can scale up directly uh, to their full-scale installation. We also conduct audits at those labs uh, to make sure all their equipment is in order. They're doing their sampling, their subsampling, they're doing their laser sizing correctly. Um, and when the, when the tests happen, um, although they're independent laboratories, we do have some input into the tests. So the labs will contact us, we will have input into the conditions used for the tests, such as what is the correct media size, what is the correct slurry density to use, uh, and then we review the results before they're issued to the clients. Um, now, based on our track record of, of one to one scale up and our, um, our strong relationship with the labs and uh, the accuracy with which the test work is carried out, um, we're able to guarantee the performance of our mills such that we now offer a 25% capital back guarantee on the mills that. What we test in the lab and the mill is designed uh, on the basis of that test. Um, if the mill doesn't achieve what we say it will achieve, there's the option for 25% of your capital back if it doesn't do um, what we said it was going to do. Uh, now, no other um, uh, equipment supply will come anywhere close to, um, to matching that. Um, however, even if there are problems on sites, we always work with our clients to achieve um, the design goals. We don't want any of our clients to walk away uh, with a mill that is not doing what they want it to do. So we, we offer a, a solution um, to our clients. We're not, we're not just offering uh, an equipment supply. Um, so the relationship doesn't end when the mill is delivered. Um, our clients have ongoing access to, to engineering, to maintenance, to aftermarket and our technical support. Um, and when a client uh, selects an ISA mill, they, they become part of a, a very large user group now. And within that user group, we're able to share information. We're able to uh, connect uh, users with, with, uh, with other ISA mill users that may have similar issues or may be able to help them out with particular issues. Um, so it's, it's quite a community that we're able to put together and, and link people up within that. Um, so Glencore Technology strives to engage with our clients as much as possible on an ongoing basis. It's really for, for mutual benefit, both for the clients, uh, but also for ourselves in terms of developing our technology. So on the diagram there, I've just sort of shown that um, when we have a site or a project or an engineering company come to us with a, with a problem or an issue to solve, um, where appropriate, we would be offering our Eisenmill technical solution that would be discussed um, with them back and forwards until we come up with an uh, agreeable solution to go forward with. Um, into that technical solution we put all of our engineering and our process knowledge. Uh, laboratory test work would come into that uh, where appropriate. Um, when the mill then moves to the implementation phase, um, we're there for the installation, the commissioning and the training. Uh, and once that's all done it moves into the operation phase. And so we don't end at the operation phase. Um, we offer our, our maintenance support, we offer operational and technical support, um, and of course we have our spares and aftermarket um, as well. And through each of those phases, whatever we learn out of those phases um, when we're present on the sites, um, that's all fed back and reviewed and adds to our knowledge base and we use what we learn there to improve our processes um, and our technology. So that's all fed back into these, uh, these yellow boxes here for use next time that we, that we engage. So one of the important things to note there is, is that all feeds back into the offering that we have with the Eisen Mill. So if you buy an Eisen Mill today, you're essentially buying the sum of all the knowledge that's been gained over the past 20 plus years uh, that's been fed into the latest designs. Um, so we have a look now at, um, at a particular installation. So this is, uh, this is at Kalgoorlie in, uh, in Western Australia. Um, so the, the flow sheet I've shown there was for the Gigi Roaster plant. And the, the Gigi plant um, essentially took the um, pyrite concentrate from the Fimiston concentrator and roasted that into a calcine uh, before going to cyanide leaching for gold recovery. Um, now back in the late uh, 90s, early 2000s, 
the sulfur grade started to increase in the concentrator and they basically produced uh, more concentrate than they were able to treat um, through the roasters. So they became uh, roaster limited. So looking at a way that they could expand that capacity without having to add additional roasting uh, capacity. So they conducted a lot of test work and eventually decided to go to the ultrafine grinding route and they selected the isomil, an M3000 isomil, to do that duty. Um, so this was the first isomil that was actually sold externally um, from the company at the time. Um, and that mill is still running today. Uh, it, it initially was installed to run in parallel uh, to the uh, roaster and the product from it was, was essentially fed into the cyanide leaching. So instead of using the, the roaster to break apart um, the, uh, the pyrite, we were essentially grinding it fine to expose the gold. Um, so back in 2012, um, KCGM embarked on an emissions reduction um, uh, project and they're basically being pressured to uh, reduce the amount of sulphur dioxide, mercury and arsenic that was being uh, emitted to atmosphere through the roasting process. And so again, through an extensive um, uh, test work and research program, they decided to go down the same route that they went down in 2001 and go with an isomil. Um, so they selected another M10,000 uh, 3 megawatt isomil to install there. Um, so that was installed um, and commissioned. So essentially the flow sheet now has, has two isomils in parallel. Um, both of those mills run in closed circuit uh, for heat balance um, issues because um, they're, they're very high specific energy input. Um, and the product from those essentially goes through the leaching and absorption stage. So this allowed the complete shutdown of the roasting circuit, so complete elimination of any atmospheric emissions. Um, that mill uh, runs at 33 tonnes an hour. Uh, the feed size is about 125 down to around 12 to 13 microns. So it's quite a large size reduction. Now typically we wouldn't do a size reduction um, that big in a single mill. It's not the most efficient way to do it. Um, if, you, if you were to split that up between two mills, um, you could probably knock maybe 15% off just by targeting the media size more specifically um, at, the, at the feed size coming into the mill. So a coarse media size to deal with the 125 micron product and then perhaps a transfer size around 30, 40 microns using a two, to mil, two millimetre media to grind down to the final product size. So this particular mill uses about 70 kilowatt hours per tonne. Um, their media consumption is a little on the high side, it's around 18 grams per kilowatt hour. As I said, typical is normally around 10, 10 to 12 maybe. Um, so I'd like to leave you with a, a few key questions uh, to ask if you're looking to get into the stirred milling um, space. Um, the first one is, is, does the mill scale up? So will you get the required grind from the mill? Will it do what the uh, mill supplier is saying it will do? Um, and is that backed up by a history, a proven history of doing so? Um, and does, it, does the supplier back it up with a decent performance guarantee? Will they, will they put their money behind it? Um, is the mill proven, uh, both technically and mechanically, in hard rock installations um, at the power rating that you're looking at running at? So operating a mill at 600 kilowatts is a lot different to running a mill close to 3 megawatts. Um, so you need, you need to ask that question. Uh, can the mill be easily maintained? Um, How is it going to be to live with um, month after month going down the track? And can you get technical maintenance and operational support going forward? or will you just be left with the mill um, after it's delivered to your door? And is what you're getting a continuously improved pro uh, product or are you just getting uh, the same mill that's, that's been built for the last 10 years? Or are you getting all the improvements that have been learned um, recently? Okay, so now um, I'd like to hand over to Paul Bandarian uh, at MacArthur River who's going to take us through a bit of a look um, over the mills up there. Thank you. Crossing over from MacArthur River in the Northern Territory. Um, I'm here with Cameron Persa, a metallurgist there at the lead zinc processing plant. Uh, he's been working at MacArthur River for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, so he's had extensive experience with the isomil. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Cameron and let him give you a quick overview just of the layout of their two M10,000 isomils, um, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'll just start at the, the drive end of the mill. 
Um, so basically, we've got the liquid resistance starter uh, and then uh, a three week megawatt uh, motor, uh, the gearbox, the two bearings, uh, and then moving on to the gland assembly and the discharge of the milk. Uh, and then obviously the grinding chamber, which we can't see inside, but we happen to have our other mill uh, down for maintenance at the moment. So uh, you can see the horizontal uh, orientation of the mill helps with the, the maintenance. You can just slide the shell off and easily access the, the internal components of the mill. Um, basically, you would have a series of discs along the shaft and then a, a rotor which has the pumping action. Um, all of, uh, so these, these are the discs and the, the rotor that have come off the mill. Um, yeah, that's basically it for the internal components. Uh, thanks for that, Cameron. Um, so. I just wanted to point out here that uh, one, one of the major developments uh, that went into the new Iser mill circuits was the um, was dropping the, the mill rails to the level of the platform. Um, and you can see that this hasn't been done at MacArthur River. Um, this was before the, the modification was made to the typical Iser mill circuit. Um, but the reason that we still come to MacArthur River to do this cross for you is that we've done a lot of development work here at MacArthur River. They've got the original ISO mills, and they're actually running three different ISO mill sizes, the M3000, M5000, and the M10000. Um, so I'll go back over to Cameron now, just, just to give us a bit of an overview of um, where the, where the ISO mills are sitting within the plant flow sheet. Um, the typical grinding duty that they're running in and how they uh, positively impact the plant's performance. Yeah, so uh, basically we have a, a full uh, rougher concentrate regrind system. Uh, the, the rougher concentrate size is around 60 micron and we're grinding that entire stream down to 7 microns. Um, so this is done in, in two parts. Uh, the first part goes through a set of pre cyclones with overflow being seven microns. Uh, and then the underflow from those cyclones is the M10,000 mill. Typically that's around 100 tonnes an hour through each mill uh, with a specific energy of around 18 kilowatt hours per tonne. So the, the feed size, as I said, is 60 micron and the discharge in a single pass open circuit to the M10,000 is uh, around 15 to 20 micron. Uh, the discharge of those mills feed another set of cyclones uh, and the underflow from those will feed into the smaller M3000 and M5000 mills. Uh, they have a specific energy of around 30 kilowatt hours per tonne. Uh, the discharge of those will feed back into the same cyclones with the overflow being uh, 7 micron again. Um, so just to show you the size of the media that we're using, we use 2 millimeter media. Um, and this is all fed automatically through through the, the mills. Uh, the only manual part is just to lift the bags up into the automatic system. In terms of operation of the mill, uh, the only real tasks that need to be done from the operations perspective is lifting the media up into the automatic feeders and checking the grind size. So um, we have a Malvin sizer, uh, so every two hours the operators check that size, make sure it's close to 7 microns, um, and then a decision made to either increase the power or, or let the, the power draw come down to, to control that grind size. Um, from a metallurgy point of view, um, the, the main task for that is to inspect the mills. Uh, so in, in uh, the service intervals, which I'll get onto later, and uh, just inform the, the maintenance staff of which parts need to be changed, uh, what the wear rates on the different components are, the cell liner, the disc, uh, the rotor, uh, and everything else. Um, 
in terms of how it improves the performance of the Karst River, really it was it doesn't improve the performance because it was the enabling um, technology for us to get down to seven micron. There really was no no other technology around to, to, to provide us with it. Um, so the only reason the Karst River is is able to run uh, is because of the eyes mill, basically. All right, thanks, Cameron. So, uh, next question is, uh, what, what's typically involved um, for the operator and also from a metallurgical perspective um, in terms of running the eyes mill? And then, uh, and then also, uh, how, how often are you shutting down the mills for maintenance? Um, and, and what's involved in that? Thanks, Paul. So I did talk about the, the operations just before and the metallurgy side. The, the maintenance part of it, um, typically for the M10,000, we're shutting the mills down every three and a half thousand hours to inspect. Um, the inspection process is, is relatively easy uh, because of the horizontal orientation of the mill. Um, we just grind the mill out and um, because of the pumping action of the rotor, we're actually able to pump all the media out of the mill um, and, and have it ready for it to be recharged when it comes back online. Um, so basically when you split the mill and push, push the shell off on the rail, uh, the whole mill is clean um, and can be inspected quite easily uh, and depending on what components are worn, we'll replace as needed. Um, so M10,000 is three and a half thousand now service life, and then the M5,000 and 3,000 uh, 3,000 now service life. Um, the, the, the smaller mills are a little bit quicker to pull apart, obviously, just being a smaller size, um, but both are yeah, very easy. All right, so that's it from us here over at MacArthur River. We're going to cross over to Virginia Lawson back at the studio to give a presentation on flotation. Thank you very much.